uh, I hope people have had the chance to go and take a look at the exhibit down the hall. It's pretty much the direct opposite of the big room. There's uh, two cases and a pegboard with uh, posters and ephemera on the exhibit. If you ha haven't had a chance yet, uh, hopefully uh, after the talk. So um, anyway, my name is Alexander Aiken. Um, I'm the co-owner of Blarium Books in San Francisco. And uh, as of earlier this week, the vice president of the ABAA. Um, and I'm, I'm A-K-I-N if you go to Google me later. So, so um, and this here is Lisbeth Tellefson. Uh, Lisbeth was the former publisher of the black lesbian journal, Ashe, of an example here. Now from being an important participant and creator, she's also become a noted archivist of social movements, uh, including the Black Panther and many other movements. Her own personal papers now reside at Yale University's Beinecke Library. Um, and there's a uh, recent book based on her extensive archives related to Angela Davis. So today I'll be talking mainly about stuff, the items that are out there in the exhibit, and Lisbeth will be talking more about the human experience and its personal relevance and how she ended up becoming a keeper of history. Many years ago, an anthropologist named Marjorie Aiken published an article called Passionate Possession, the Formation of Private Collections, which is included in this book from the Smithsonian. In this work of genius, as I say totally objectively, even though she's my mom, <laughs> she describes a variety of motivations that underlie the drive to collect. Um, ranging from nostalgia, the indulgence of personal taste, uh, accumulation of wealth, to things like uh, showing your individualism through unusual collections or the drive to complete something. I'll leave it to Lisbeth to talk about her motivations, but she's built a collection of materials about Angela Davis that is so magnificent, it's been the subject of an exhibit at the Zermeli Art Museum at Rutgers University, and is coming to the Oakland Museum of California in October of this year. Dealers who find unusual material related to Angela Davis always go to her. Um, there's an advantage to being known for your specialties. She also has a sort of grassroots advantage in collecting in that she's been close to so many people uh, who are activists, who were, who were on the scene at the time and you know, might have some stuff in the back of the closet somewhere. So with this in mind, let's think about the ways that one might collect the history of radical activism in Oakland. This is a town with a rich history of social movements. Uh, by the turn of the 20th century, Oakland was already home to advocates for all sorts of reforms, from the days of Jack London and the Socialist Party to the later influx of African American workers and the struggle for equality in the post-war period. Uh, there were student demonstrations during the Vietnam War, uh, Asian American and Latino movements, uh, inspired in part by the Panthers. Uh, all these threads that are actually quite interconnected. Now, ideas of what is progressive have evolved. Uh, there were some issues that were seen as incredibly important to reformers in the past, but now seem quaint, like prohibition, or offensive, like eugenics. Nowadays, people think of socialism as being anti-racist, but that wasn't always the case. Um, in its early days, socialism was sometimes interpreted as protecting the white working class. Uh, this is from a Jack London book that we'll see in a minute. One reason to collect pub, uh, published materials that came from these groups um, is to look at them as a historian would. Uh, they can help to humanize and round out their creators and the world in which they lived. And in this respect, they have a value that's completely separate from the price they might achieve at auction. Uh, in the exhibit of Oakland activist materials that you'll see outside, uh, you'll see some quite valuable items, but there are also th some things there that I sell in my shop for as little as $10 but they're no less valuable to anyone who wants to understand and appreciate the history of Oakland, uh, to trace the threads that have crisscrossed and interwoven to give this town the legacy that it has today. And they show that collecting, collecting Oakland activist history is something that is really within anyone's reach. So with that in mind, uh, let's take a quick tour through some of the items that are uh, on exhibit outside. This is the earliest item in the exhibit. Uh, published by the Nationalist Club in Oakland in 1891. Nationalism has taken on a different meaning, but in those days, the Nationalist Clubs defined their purpose as to, quote, 
end capitalism's greed and distinction, distinctions between the classes while promoting a peaceful, ethical, and truly progressive human race. Now, the author of this pamphlet was no outcast in Oakland society. He was an editor at the Oakland Inquirer, and he went on actually to become secretary of the Oakland Chamber of Commerce. In this pamphlet from 1912, uh, James Osborne of the Rice Institute in Oakland argues that socialism is the only philosophy of government compatible with the or original revolutionary spirit of 1776. Jack London put Oakland on the map in many ways for a broader audience. Uh, he was, of course, as well as an author of fiction, a prominent socialist activist. Uh, his work is a place where the traditional concept of antiquarian books, you know, looking for first editions with dust jackets and so on, overlaps with the history of political action. Union organizing and other labor activism is a continuous thread in Oakland history. Uh, this leaflet was uh, published in 1946 as part of an organizing drive for mostly female clerks at Hastings and Kahn's department stores in Oakland. In later years, we see some interesting intersections between labor activism and what would seem to be the influence of countercultural art. Uh, this mimeograph leaflet from the 60s was made by rank and file activists in some union, uh, it's not clear which union, but the artwork depicts uh, corrupt union leadership suckling at the breast of the big contractors while starving rank and file members are offering up their uh, bottles uh, in, as their dues. Uh, the cultural movements of the 60s saw expression in Oakland in publications like Yawp, which was a multicultural collection of poetry, prose, and art published by students at Laney College in 1968. Now, in the late 60s, of course, things got pretty heavy. Uh, student protests against the draft in the Vietnam War it could become very volatile. This 1969 booklet is about first aid for activists who might find themselves uh, in confrontations with police. It was anonymously published, but I spoke with the author's widow. Um, he was a Jewish doctor who volunteered his services at many local demonstrations, including the Native American occupation of Alcatraz. Not all Oakland activists were on the left, of course. The Toxin newsletter's goal was to expose what they saw as a red conspiracy behind the uh, burgeoning student movement and the new left in the Bay Area. Uh, they had correspondents attend local demonstrations and surreptitiously take photos of people uh, who were there uh, as an effort to show the presence of known communists and to keep track of organizers. Uh, from a historical viewpoint, it's actually very useful because uh, they noticed a lot of things that people didn't necessarily talk about later. Now, today, Oakland is most known for its legacy of activism in the black community. Uh, as you know, World War II industry brought a huge influx of workers from the South, and a lot of people uh, think of local black activism as coming to fruition after the war. But we can actually go back a lot further. Um, this is a 1917 yearbook of the local branch of the NAACP. And as you can see, the local officers in Oakland and San Francisco were largely women. This issue of the yearbook describes several campaigns that the organization undertook in that year, including blocking a proposed segregation uh, ordinance. They, they were going to pass a law to impose segregation in Oakland. In the summer of 1966, the phrase black power entered the mainstream political lexicon from Stokely Carmichael uh, of the Congress of Racial Equality, uh, uh, Congress of Racial Equality, uh, or CORE. In 1967, CORE held its uh, national conference uh, here in Oakland. The marquee guest, of course, was the boxer Muhammad Ali, but uh, other people announced on the leaflet included the uh, comedian and activist Dick Gregory, uh, Ron Karenga, the creator of Kwanzaa, uh, Leroy Jones, uh, soon to be known as Amiri Baraka, and even two ambassadors from African uh, countries. The Black Panthers, of course, came out of the Black Power milieu, and uh, my friend Lisbeth's going to talk more about them soon. But for now, let's look at some of the items published by or about the Panthers that are in the exhibit, stuff that sometimes seems so timely today that it's hard to believe it was published more than half a century ago. 
This poster has no text. It's just a photo of Huey Newton that was taken at a memorial rally for Denzel Dowell, who had been killed by police in Contra Costa County. Uh, Emery Douglas recently identified it in a conversation with Lisbeth as one of the earliest posters that he produced for the Panthers. Um, Emery Douglas was, of course, their Minister of Culture. Uh, he's still active today, incidentally. Uh, the alley across the street from my bookstore has one of his recent murals. In uh, 1967, Huey Newton was in a shootout with police. He was injured, but one officer died. And his trial came to be seen as about more than just his case, but a trial of the right of black people to defend themselves and to get a fair hearing. There was real fear that he would be killed as a way to silence the Black Panther Party. Uh, as those demonstrators outside of the courthouse warned, the sky's the limit if you kill Huey Newton. In 1968, he was convicted of voluntary manslaughter, and to celebrate his conviction, two Oakland police shot up the Panther office. Um, this is a press photo uh, from Lisbeth's collection showing what it looked like afterwards. You can see all the bullet holes in, in the window. Newton had uh, written a poem that concluded, by surrendering my life to the revolution, I found eternal life, revolutionary suicide. That was the title of his best-selling book, and that cover image shows a poster. If you look back at this window, you can see that very poster in the middle um, with the bullet holes in it. While he was in prison, the slogan, Free Huey, started to appear everywhere. And he actually ran for Congress in the November 1968 election as a candidate of the Peace and Freedom Party. Um, in May 1970, his conviction was reversed. And after two subsequent trials ended in hung juries, uh, the charges against him were dropped. The Black Panther Party got increasingly involved in Oakland politics, with members running for local office or working with elected officials. This, I think, is a great poster because it draws together so many aspects of the Black Panther Party's work. Uh, Bobby Seale, who had co-founded the Panthers in 1966, was running for mayor. Elaine Brown was running for city council. Uh, at this rally, they're also offering uh, sickle cell anemia tests, distributing free groceries. And it's interesting to note some of the people who were involved. Uh, Cecil Williams from Glide Church in San Francisco. Ron Dellums, who uh, was a longtime congressman, and so on. Here's another Bobby Seale poster from his run for mayor in 1973. There's quite a change in the sort of overall presentation. Uh, Seale came in second in the field of nine candidates that year. This was a birthday party slash campaign event for Elaine Brown, who was the head of the party from uh, 1974 to 77. In this year, she got 44% of the vote in Oakland. Her memoir, A Taste of Power, is a really eye-opening book, especially for its discussion of the role of women in the party. Now, aside from straight up political materials, there are many cultural works by Black Panthers. Uh, Elaine Brown had, of course, recorded an album. Uh, poetry by uh, Huey Newton and Erica Huggins was collected in this volume, published by City Lights Books. Uh, but there were also many very, uh, you know, lesser known people who were associated in some way with the Black Panther uh, Party, who self-published works uh, reflective of the cultural ferment in Oakland at the time, like this poetry collection uh, by Donald F. Williams. There was a surge of interest from white radicals and others in the broader community that led to the publication of explanatory materials uh, like these. Uh, Terry Cannon, who put this together, was a white activist who'd been involved in the civil rights movement and had worked in Alabama in support of the Lowndes County Freedom Organization, which was a group that inspired the Panthers. Uh, underground newspapers serving primarily white Communities also uh, devoted extensive space to material by and about the Panthers. Uh, here's an issue of the Old Mole from Boston uh, that uh, discusses uh, Bobby Hutton, who had been shot by police in Oakland, and Fred Hampton, who had been killed in his sleep just a few days uh, before this issue came out. Um, this section from the September 1969 issue of The Movement, published in San Francisco, uh, addresses a feminist audience with new perspectives and critiques based on the experiences of black women. 
and newspapers could take advantage of the centerfold page to print sort of makeshift posters that could be taken out and put on a wall. Uh, here's the centerfold page from the December 1970 issue of The Activist calling for the release of Bobby Seale and Erica Huggins. Moreover, the Panthers drew interest from beyond the borders of the United States. Uh, in Cuba, especially, the eye-catching work of Emery Douglas inspired posters and magazine covers. Uh, here's an issue of Tricontinental, a Cuban magazine. You can compare the image to this uh, greeting card produced by Emery Douglas. Um, you see one of the women is the same but reversed and with color added. Here's a Cuban poster from OSPOL, the Organization of Solidarity of the Peoples of Africa, Asia, and Latin America, which uh, borrows that iconic image of Huey Newton. Now, people who had been involved with the Black Panthers went on to continue their community involvement in many ways. Uh, Erica Huggins, <clears throat> who you remember from that poster, was a director of the Oakland Community School, and our exhibit outside includes a 1980 graduation program with photos of the students who were finishing. Uh, the school grew out of the Black Panther Party's 10-point uh, program, in which point five called for educating black people about their true history. Now, for a small school, th these were, uh, I guess, all the students finishing in that year. So it was rather small, but its students had outsized uh, accomplishments. Uh, Kalita Smith at the lower right there became a successful actress. Um, students from other years include a member of the Digital Underground. Uh, Fred Blackwell became head of San Francisco Redevelopment and so on. And uh, I, I might add that um, Erica Huggins, who was the director of that school, we have the honor of having her in the audience here today. So I thank her for coming and for all she's done over the years. Yeah. The strong local tradition of black radicalism led many in Oakland to support anti-colonial movements in Africa, including the global campaign against apartheid in South Africa. And Oakland's prominent role in the US boycott movement earned it recognition when the South African government released Nelson Mandela in 1990. Uh, Oakland was the final stop of his US tour, and he addressed a crowd of about 58,000 here. Um, that pin next to the flyer is one that someone saved uh, from that visit. Now, another form of activism is the effort within immigrant communities to support newcomers, to provide information helping to adapt to the new society and to defend the rights of that group. Uh, for a while, Oakland was home to the only Portuguese language newspaper in the Western US for immigrants from Portuguese speaking countries. When the fascists uh, took over in Italy, many anti-fascists went into exile. Uh, this pamphlet is about uh, Vincent Ferrero and Dominique Salito, uh, two I Italian immigrants who ran a restaurant here in Oakland. Um, they rented space to some anarchists who uh, uh, published a newspaper. So in 1934, the US immigration authorities arrested them and attempted to deport them back to Italy uh, for, uh, for their role in that. Uh, the Chinese Culture Center of Oakland, uh, here's an example of a, a certificate of appointment for an honorary advisor. A uh, bulletin from the Asian Law Caucus in 1982. Uh, Filipino immigrants in Oakland uh, worked from exile to challenge the dictatorship of Ferdinand Marcos back in the Philippines. Local Chicano activists uh, reissued a classic text by Ricardo Flores Magón in 1974 with additional text added uh, commemorating International Women's Day and discussing the importance of understanding Chicano history. For many years, Inkworks was a go-to press in the Bay Area for activist groups of all types. Um, this poster, printed by Inkworks in Oakland in 1975, draws a connection between the feminist movement and the reunification of Vietnam in that year. Now, the sorts of materials that we're looking at were all at one time produced to spread word of events, to persuade the reader. Rarely did people think of them, uh, even, you know, even those dramatic Black Panther posters, as something that would be bought and sold as collectibles decades later. Luckily, there were people who recognized their significance and preserved them. By the same token, though, there are materials being produced today that could someday be seen in a new light. Uh, I don't know if you remember the Occupy demonstrations uh, about 11 years ago. Um, I put out word at the time that if people went and collected up all the leaflets and other publications that were circulating, I, I would pay for them. And uh, I got about three big boxes of stuff. 
and even at that time, right when it was still happening, uh, I got three major uh, university libraries uh, uh, interested in obtaining those collections. Uh, and you can add to a collection of Oakland activist history by saving programs for community events, uh, such as this one that was produced by Lisbeth. So when thinking about things like this, what does it really mean to be a collector? A lot of people don't think of themselves that way, even though they are. You know, well, I can't afford first editions by famous authors or whatever. But a collector can be anyone who makes the, uh, who, who appreciates the importance of something that others might have overlooked, uh, who makes the effort to gather it together to preserve it and to present it in a new way that shows others the significance of what they have missed. Um, Lincoln Cushing, who's in the audience here, is going to be teaching a, a course on uh, community archiving at Berkeley. And maybe afterwards, if anyone's interested, they can uh, speak to him. Now, Lisbeth is an example of someone who's been an active participant, a maker of local history, who has become one of its keepers. And she's someone who I respect and appreciate immensely, and soon you'll see why. Um, without further ado, I want to hand it over to Lisbeth Tellefson. Five people, y'all. He said five people. Um, okay, first of all, um, I want to thank you, Alex, because I am not somebody who does a lot of public speaking. It is not something that comes naturally to me. And um, if you ask me to do something like this, my first, second, and third response is always no, and yet here I am. So well done, you. Um, okay. Uh, so, there we go. Um, so, uh, Alex has done a great job talking about, um, you know, the items of Oakland activist history. And I'm going to give you um, a little bit of my collector journey. So, I'm like the whimsy portion of the program. So, bear with me. Um, this is, uh, yeah how a geeky little kid with collections became somebody who uh, is looked upon you know, well because of those collections. So it's how a rainbow movement stepchild parlayed a comic book collection into a bona fide career. <laughs> so um, yeah, thinking about um, how I got here uh, you know, in gathering material, um, it really seems like, in many ways, I was kind of born for this. It doesn't seem like an accident. Um, I was born in San Francisco in 1961, stone's throw from the Haight-Ashbury. Um, we moved to Berkeley when I was a toddler. Uh, and my mom, who was a Norwegian immigrant, um, landed a job at the co-op credit union in Berkeley, which was like a hotbed of political activity. And for someone who uh, never became a citizen. She was a Norwegian citizen her entire life. Um, we were smack dab in the middle of it. So um, I was raised in an eclectic village of uh, immigrants, lefties, black communists, and single moms. That was, that was my world. Um, it was also what I consider the golden age of collecting like literally every box of cereal, every full tank of gas, you know, came with some sort of collectible antenna ball. And, um, you know, even our parents were in on it. They collected blue chip stamps, which could be turned into a toaster. So their motives were much more practical than ours. And um, it did not help that the closest shop like at the end of our block was Dave's Hobby Shop, which was Berkeley's best hobby shop, and it sucked up the allowance of every kid within a six block radius. So comic books, baseball cards, Hot Wheels, stamps, you name it, our collections were social currency, and we fought long and hard for, for bragging rights. And um, you know, since we never had a lot of money, the lessons that I learned at that point, like resourcefulness and tenacity and patience, um, are still things I use to this day. 
Um, my mom's boyfriend growing up was, uh, was Matt Crawford. Um, he was uh, many years her senior, and uh, he was like a grandfather figure to me in my life. Um, he had come to Oakland as a child during the Great Migration in 1911 and began a storied activist career, six decades. Um, in the 30s, he was the second black chiropractor in Oakland, and he had a uh, health and wellness column in a black newspaper in the 30s. And um, he also was lifelong friends with folks like Paul Robeson and Jessica Mitford and Langston Hughes. And he made it his personal mission to immerse me in black culture. And though I really didn't appreciate it much at the time, you know, he said someday I would, and he was right. So by the age of seven, I was dragged to more robes and revivals and, and whatnot. I, I remember one time we're at one of his friend's house, and he puts me on the phone with Paul Robeson Jr., and I'm like six. And he's handing me this phone, and I'm like, this is so stupid. Why would I want, what, ugh, grown-ups. So, yeah, but he was right. Who's laughing now? Um, and probably most importantly, he was his generation's keeper of the papers. Um, you know, he had been the secretary of the National Negro Congress and active in fights like saving the Scottsboro Boys, and his file cabinets were um, a treasure trove of decades and decades and decades of black history. And the importance of that role was instilled in me in a very early age. Um, in 1932, uh, this is Matt uh, left center with glasses on, with his uh, arm around his best friend, Louise Thompson. And they were among a group of young African Americans who sailed to the Soviet Union with the intent of making a film on black culture. Um, the film never got made, but wow, were some adventures had. And um, the woman he has his hand around, Louise Thompson, was a significant figure in the Harlem Renaissance. She was a secretary for the patron of Zora Neale Hurston and Langston Hughes, and uh, was briefly married to the writer Wallace Thurman, and would later marry William L. Patterson, who was a very famous um, black communist uh, attorney. And as a child, um, I would listen to their stories, though I don't really, I didn't really retain much, but there were very real takeaways. Um, when we would go visit their friends' houses, uh, you know, I was, their own children were long gone, so I was usually the only kid in the mix, and I would go looking for the room with a television set. And all of their houses felt the same. They had bookcases overflowing with books. Every surface, every wall, was covered with artwork and mementos of their travels. And, you know, I, I kind of just thought that that's how you, that's what grown folks did. You know, you traveled the world, you rabble roused and fought the good fight and, uh, you know, gathered ephemera and took it home and, you know, lived surrounded by the treasures accumulated along the way. So, um, yeah, as a, as a teenager, one of my earliest jobs was working in this building, the Print Mint, which is uh, famous here in Berkeley, or should I say infamous, as an underground publisher, distributor of, um, wow. <laughs> All I remember is Young Lust comic books everywhere because they kind of scarred me at the age of 15. But, um, it was really a, a crash course into the world of alternative press, political graphics. Um, it was like a heady mix of art, pop culture, counterculture. And um, here is where I learned to run a printing press. 
And at the age of 21, I started my own business, and I opened my own press room and ran a printing press for 25 years. And this period really instilled in me just a love of old school, cut and paste graphic arts, you know. Um, yeah, so I'm a pop culture kid, I'm a counterculture kid. And, uh, you know, as I got older, um, my taste in posters changed, you know, instead of Jackson 5 centerfolds. Um, now it was about revolutionaries and, <laughs> you know, and, and local political movements and things that um, I would be caught dead having on my walls. And, uh, you know, always posters with excellent graphics. Um, that's never changed. So in my 20s, um, as the collections of my youth fell away, um, I discovered Latin music. I fell in love, you know, my junior year in high school, I was up at Leopold's renting records and I discovered salsa and rumba and that total immersion, single-minded focus I'd always been able to put towards my collections as a kid now turned to Latin jazz and salsa. Um, I began studying as a percussion, percussionist and became a budding ethnomusicologist. Um, and uh, if any of you are impressed with the organization here, I also had a stint at KPFA Radio as a recording engineer and as their record librarian, and I've kept my collection in similar state ever since. Um, so in 1985, I got the opportunity to travel to Cuba as uh, it was the one of uh, first of several trips as the lone woman amongst a group of percussionists um, doing research. We brought with us the latest video and recording equipment, and I kind of, uh, you know, saw this as my chapter, um, as, you know, the Zora Neale Hurston, Alan Lomax portion of the program. So um, my constant companion was my Pentax camera, and, uh, with my camera and the video recorder, I documented everything, much to everyone around me chagrin. I was not popular, um, but they're all glad I did it now, yeah. Um, so our troop returned from Cuba with dozens of hours of rare footage. We'd gotten lessons from some of the most significant um, figures in Afro-Cuban music, dance culture, and we started a project to um, gather from around the country um, anything we could get our hands on around Afro-Cuban culture and created a digital archive that was unprecedented. So by the end of the 80s, the largest Afro-Cuban archive was housed in my Mission District apartment and it, um, it spurred development in ways that I couldn't even f have foreseen. Um, you know, the sacred bata lessons that I was under no circumstances to give to women ever. I promptly came home and gave to Carolyn Brandy and she would start <laughs> teaching a generation of women um, this history. So, um, yeah, during my first trip, um, when we had some free time, I would be scouring the shops, um, mostly record shops, and I stumbled across some old Cuban posters. Um, you know, I had grown up with the iconic image of Che. You know, Telegraph Avenue, every head shop has Che, Rasputin, Marilyn, Elvis. Um, but seeing him in this context kind of struck me. And, you know, as a printer, I was concerned about the, the paper stock. It was just really kind of deteriorating. So that trip, I came home with 32 albums, uh, which was no easy feat, and an armful of posters. And um, that trip began my foray into Cuban poster collecting. 
Ah, so in 1989, my life took a turn as I co-founded a black lesbian journal, a cultural arts organization called Ashe. Um, now, the mid to late 80s were kind of a renaissance time. I like into the Harlem Renaissance for black gay folk. Um, it was a, a time where culture was exploding. There were folks like um, filmmaker Marlon Riggs, poets Essex Hemphill and Pat Parker, Audre Lorde. Um, they were all folks that I got the opportunity to work alongside. Um, and I also, as the editor publisher for the first year, got a chance to put my um, old school graphic design skills, cut and paste, cut and paste. Yeah. So Ashe, as a publication that had um, global distribution, I think we were in something like 14 countries at our height, which with um, subscribers that included folks like Angela Davis and Alice Walker, and uh, Roxanne Gay, which actually made me super happy when I went back. I'm like, are you the Roxanne Gay? But, um, you know, as a publication, virtually anything happening globally in the area of, you know, lesbians of color or black LGBT folk came through our pages. So we were on the mailing list of like the first black gay organization in South Africa. and. I began to, this was the moment where I stepped into the role of the keeper of the papers and I just began collecting everything that was coming through. And um, I, spent, uh, I spent a lot of money on storage units keeping all these boxes and they could easily have gotten thrown out and I would have thrown away gems like personal correspondence from Audre Lorde, which I treasure. And uh, it was also my uh, first foray into event production. Um, and this is, my, this, this is my attempt at graphic arts, okay? This is the best that I can do. Not much of a designer, but you know, it got the job done. Um, black lesbian poet Pat Parker was our biggest champion and mentor during the first six months of Ashe. And after six months, she actually passed away from cancer. And after she died, her widow um, asked if I would come help organize her papers and gave me a key to the house. And in my free time, I would go work through the file cabinet trying to organize things. And I stumbled across 20 years of correspondence between Pat and Audre Lorde. And their lives had mirrored each other so interestingly. They were both, um, at the time, the only black poets in a fairly white world, married to white men. Um, they both came out. Um, they both went through battles with cancer. And these letters covered it all. And uh, I asked if I could make a copy, you know, with the promise that I wouldn't do anything with it. And uh, she said yes. And for 20 years, those papers stayed in their basement until uh, they, I think they eventually made their way to Harvard a couple years ago and are now the subject of a book um, that, you know, includes those letters. So um, I produced an Audre Lorde memorial in 1992, and 15 years later, a friend of mine contacted me and said she wanted to do another event. And this time, could we do it about Audrey and Pat? And I remembered those letters, and I got permission from the family. I said, you know, this is what we're trying to do. We would love to use them um, somehow. And uh, lesbian poet Judy Gron and I combed through Audrey and Pat's work and put together kind of a choreo poem um, with them speaking to each other, with Jewel Gomez as, as the voice of 
Audrey and Pat's former roommate, musician Linda Tillery, as the voice of Pat. So um, this event, Sister Comrade, um, I consider one of the crowning achievements of my life. It's one of the things I'm most proud of. So, almost done. How am I doing? Okay, good, good, good. Okay, so this is a little bit of a flashback. Um, I think as an 11-year-old, I remember watching um, documentaries on PBS, like old jazz documentaries that would have old black and white footage, you know, like you could see Billie Holiday sitting in a club, and in the credits, it was always, the footage was from the collection of David Chertok. And, you know, everybody else was psyched about the documentary, and I was obsessed with David Chertok. How, 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 how does he get his name up there? And when I got my first TV credit, I, I anyway, it was for a Black Panther documentary on VH1 called Lords of the Revolution, and, um, yeah, the 11-year-old couldn't me is super psyched, and that's who's talking right now. So um, in 2003, I got word that there was a new book on Cuban posters coming out. And the author was actually in Berkeley, and he was going to be speaking at Black Oak Books. And I was like, right on. So I, I trucked down there. And uh, this book, Revolution Cuban Poster Art by Lincoln Cushing, voila. Um, during his talk, he had an older gentleman in the audience stand up and he said, I would like to thank Michael Rossman, whose collection of 25,000 political posters um, helped form the basis of this book. And my jaw dropped open. I'm like, 25, what does he live in, an airplane hangar? I, I, I couldn't fathom it, and so I went to introduce myself, and he was very gracious. He invited me over to show me how he did it, and he was thoroughly ingenious. And the three of us would go on to form the political poster portal with um, the idea of digitizing our collections and creating a huge catalog of political posters. Um, you know, I was the newbie in the group, probably had the smallest collection of anybody, but I was new blood and they were eager to have me. And so to make it sexy for me, um, they said, why don't we start with the Angela Davis posters? And I'm like, yeah. So um, Lincoln and Michael had built this ingenious track system to shoot archival slides and my job was to get the slides processed and to get them digitized. And at the time, I had to send them all the way to Canada. And so when these CDs came back and I popped them into my computer and, you know, this showed up on my screen and the graphic head was able to like, Oh, that's the same image. Oh, look, they did that. Oh, they reviewed it. Oh, I, I, I couldn't tell you how revelatory this moment was to me. And now, you know, Google Images can do the same thing in 30 seconds, so it doesn't have the same impact. But um, it, it changed the game as far as I'm concerned. And also um, really had me thinking about what digital archives and how powerful they could be and how much um, they could offer beyond the analog type collections. So um, many years later, uh, all those boxes accumulated during the Ashe years, um, I discovered Bolarium Books doesn't just sell books, they also place manuscript collections and I discovered manuscript collections could apply to dozens and dozens of boxes of random paper. And when this UC Berkeley College dropout got 
five figures for those <laughs> boxes to be um, to go to Yale and have Yale promote the heck out of it such that we traveled to New Haven to the grandest library I've ever been in my life. And uh, Shea has a whole kiosk, Andy Warhol to the left, August Wilson to the right, and in the corner is the Gutenberg Bible. I thought, Jarive. <laughs> and um, yeah. So um, my Cuban poster collection, um, uh, the Ospal posters, um, there was a subset of posters that were dedicated to the solidarity with black struggles in America. And so these were some of my holy grail favorite posters. Um, these two here on the left, um, even though the Cuban designer Lazaro Abreu is credited, it does include the artwork of Black Panther Minister of Culture Emery Douglas. And uh, on the right, Alfredo Rostgard um, did this Black Power poster. And I discovered that there was an auction, an institutional auction that was happening in New York um, called Swan Galleries, Print and Manuscript African Americana. And this was where the museums bought. You know, museums don't buy on eBay. They don't go to garage sales. Um, but they go to these institutional auctions. And when somebody turned me on to this, I consigned these two posters to be sold as a lot. I thought that was kind of a kick. And um, they estimated they would go for like six to eight hundred dollars, which I thought, great, I'm not losing money. Um, and when the buyer paid six thousand, uh, it was a wake-up call. But more than the money, the buyer was the Smithsonian. And they were building the collection for their new National Museum of African American History and Culture. And I've never missed another auction since. Um, this is probably the piece that put me on the map in the collector world. Um, uh, Michael Rossman and I were probably the two biggest users of eBay. <laughs> it probably takes the first hour of every one of my days. And um, I stumbled across this old weird, it's kind of like a folk art, Guidon, <laughs> um, you know, it had uh, an applique felt, panther, paw print, um, but the color scheme, the green and white, placed it in Lowndes County, Alabama as the precursor to the Black Panther Party that we know. And while I couldn't tell if it was legitimate or what kind of condition it is, I think you know, I invested a little bit of money, you know, under $200 just, just to see. And when I got it in the mail, it was clear it was a piece from that period. Um, it was not in great shape, but I also recognize this is a piece of history that's probably deserves better than sitting in a box somewhere on my shelf. So I consigned it with Swan Galleries. Um, I think they assigned maybe $1,500 as their estimate of value. So I vaguely remember sitting in the audience when it hit 20,000, the room kind of <laughs> disappeared. Um, when Nicholas Lowry, the head of Swan Galleries, hammered, I think the buyer paid something like $42,000 and he said, congratulations, we've just set a world record for a piece of Black Panther history. And as momentous as that moment was, um, the only reason bidding had gone that high was because the Smithsonian buyers were in the audience and desperately trying to get it for their new museum. And they were the losing bid. And uh, so I, I, I could not have something like that happen again. So I made introductions with the curators at the Smithsonian 
and uh, got my little SAM.gov government vendor license and began to deal with them directly. And uh, this is Erica and I at the um, donor preview at the opening of their museum. And uh, I think they went from having a collection of zero because they could not borrow from other Smithsonian's. They collected upward of 30,000 pieces from local collectors like myself. Um, maybe 3,300 made the inaugural exhibit and a dozen of them were from my collection. Um, the, the biggest piece, this um, America Free Angela Faith Ringgold print from 1971, she had produced as a fundraiser for the Free Angela Davis Committee, um, was actually the centerpiece of their black arts kiosk. And to this day, they use it as an integral thread in their digital collections. So um, I've contributed artwork and archival materials to exhibits around the world. I've curated exhibits. And this is one of my favorite moments, because um, Colin Kaepernick uh, does a lot of um, philanthropic work in the community. And under, you know, with absolutely no publicity, he put on a camp for about 100 um, underserved youth in Oakland. And he taught them financial literacy, their rights. He gave them backpacks full of ancestry DNA kits and the autobiography of Malcolm X. And, and the venue that he chose was the site of our exhibit. And he said he really wanted this as a backdrop for his first Know Your Rights camp. Um, this is Lincoln and I. Um, we donated um, dozens and dozens of posters to SF MoMA. So now when I go to the museum and I see my little tag, um, that gives me such great joy. Collection of Lisbeth Tellefsen. Um, This is um, one of our latest projects. Um, in West Oakland, actually not far from here, maybe a mile from here, is the Women of the Black Panther Party Mural House and Mini Museum. Um, a local resident who wanted to honor this history um, did her whole house as an honor to the Women of the Black Panther Party and devoted the downstairs apartment to um, a pop-up exhibit that I created that traces uh, the Black Panther Party's history. Um, it's at Ninth and Center, a block, two blocks north of the West Oakland BART station, if anybody's interested. And what is probably the crowning achievement of my career is the exhibit on Angela Davis that is up right now. Um, almost 300 pieces from my archive form the basis of this exhibit that will be coming to the Oakland Museum in uh, October of 2022. And um, next, next month, um, Angela and I will be there speaking about it. I'm actually a little embarrassed for her to see it because, yeah, I collected all that stuff. So <laughs> rando. <sighs> yeah. And um, probably the highlight is uh, the exhibit catalog that was published by uh, German art house publisher, Hermer Verlag, um, and is uh, it's available everybody, everywhere now. Angela Davis sees the time. And uh, yeah, I wish my mother was here to see it, because look, oh, I'm published. So that is it. <laughs> ah. Oh, I'll, I'll read the acknowledgments out loud. So thank you, Alex Aiken and Bellarium, for um, yeah being such an excellent partner in so many of my archival triumphs. I really could not have done it without you. Um, thank you to Lincoln and the late Michael for everything. 
you know, not to mention all the work that you do donating your time to really preserve this history of political posters. And uh, special thanks to Erica, who would really live like a Zen minimalist, <laughs> you know, and instead is surrounded by papers and clutter and puts up with me anyway. So thank you all. So we do have a few minutes if anyone has any questions in the audience. Um, uh, question right here. Um, that your many huge collections of posters, uh, it's a sort of a two-part question. What can you say to enlighten us regarding the intellectual property status, if any, of some or all of the posters that you were showing us? Are they in the public domain, or are they considered intellectual property of one or another artist? I should say that the person asking this question is Marty Goodman, who's involved in scanning and putting a lot of stuff in the public domain, and so this is a very... <laughs> Busted. <laughs> you know, I will say um, that probably the person who is best able to answer this question is Lincoln Cushion, who's sitting in the audience. I mean, off the top of my head, some are, some aren't, and mm. there is huge gray area. Um, you know, you do the best that you can do, and um, if somebody pops up all these years later, mea culpa, mea culpa. Um, but is there anything you want to say about that? It's a complicated answer. I mean, from my point of view, I mean, I've been both a producer and a documentarian. And the, these posters are meant to be public. So you've got to look at the impetus of this. These were not meant to be private and sold. These were meant to be out in the street, making a statement. And so the, the producer's goal was a public one. So there, there's, there's legal and ethical questions. So the legal issues are partly, you know, is it listed as copyright? so forth, but the ethical ones are, you don't want to stomp on an individual's intellectual property. But my experience of doing this for many years, having published many books, is that in general, if you make a good faith effort at, con at seeing if it's okay, and using it respectfully, that you can share it in a public format, and it's, a good, it's an okay thing. So you wouldn't make t-shirts and sell them, but in general, these public political documents have a, sort of a different life than you know, a Shakespeare folio. And you had another question, right? The, the, the obvious follow-up question to that, and the reason I preceded it with that question is, um, what prospect is there of making these images that you have you, I heard you say many, many times, we, I created digital images, I created digital images. What prospect is, that, is there for making them generally freely available to the world and the public? Um, you know, I will say I get a lot of requests for these images, and it always comes with the caveat that... Um, you need to clear rights with the rights holders. You know, I might be able to provide, um, you know, an image file of something that I have, but if you are publishing it or doing something like that, you have to do, you have to track down who owns the rights. Um, you know, that said, you know, I've also done a lot of work to not pollute the, you know, places like eBay and Etsy where anybody will take, you know, a, a decent copy and start to make mugs and t-shirts out of it, you know? So it's, it's a big question. There's no real answers. I think a lot of the political artists of today, you know, work with things like Creative Commons licenses and they're starting to address that up front which you know it's kind of sad that that didn't exist for, for the record of the hundreds of thousands of pages that i've digitized over the last 10 years um now occasionally 
rarely, but it has happened, uh, folks download by extremely high resolution, meticulously made images of revolutionary art, and then print it and put it up for sale on eBay. Um, the first time I saw that, I had a momentary twinge. Um, gee, I know these people are ripping off my work, but it was momentary, it lasted seconds. The lasting reaction was, this is great, more people get a chance to see this and um, appreciate it. Yeah. I just wanted to ask if you may be rather shy of giving uh, speeches. I think you did fantastic. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Number two, I would love to I would love to let this has been recorded so that it could go on YouTube. I would love to share this with my family. It, oh. it, it has been uh, recorded actually and it will go on YouTube, yes. And Uh, yes, it's at the corner of 9th and Center Street. And uh, um, Erica, do you remember the URL? Is it womenofthebpp.org? It was. It's, uh, you could also put in West Oakland Mural Project. Oh, West Oakland Mural Project. We'll also bring that up. Yeah. yeah. She was asking about the mural house that Elizabeth talked about. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Boom. Oh.